So this evening, um, I will be taking just a portion of what we have read here, the very popular verse in Isaiah 4, 6 that says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And uh, I will try to just give you some of my thoughts as regards what I think the Lord wants us to remember. I know it's a verse that we all know, uh, but just so that we can learn and glean for, from, from it. As a way of introduction, I wanted to direct your thoughts to, to something about the law. And so I wrote a couple of things down. I, I, I said here, yeah, when Adam and Eve were put in the garden, you will notice that God told them what to do and what not to do. When God called Abram, again, God told him what to do and what not to do. When God led the Israelites out of Egypt, God told them what to do and what not to do. And that what to do and not what to do are his laws. He wrote in the tablet of stones and impressed it upon the hearts of men, revealing to mankind who he is. And as we look at this law that tells us what to do and not what to do, which is the Bible, we see clearly the love of God. Clearly we see the holiness of God, the justice of God. We see his mercy. We see his power, his sovereignty, his grace, and his wrath. And, and as we see all these at the center of all these that we see, we see the exalted son of God as he himself is the very image of God. So brothers and sisters, no information about God ever came from any man. All truth about God is revealed to man by God. And so we see that God is light. And that means God is knowledge. And we are darkness. And that means we are ignorant and dead. So God is the one with all the knowledge. And just even generally speaking and thinking through this, which of you know of a country where there is no law? Do you know of a family where there is no law, where the children can do whatever pleases them? Can you, for a moment, imagine Lagos without law? Chaos, isn't it? Chaos. So if human laws are so beneficial, how much more the laws of God? Because while human laws have temporal benefits, the laws of God have eternal benefits. But sadly today, sadly today, sorry, but sadly today, many so-called Christians don't want anything to do with God's law. They don't want God to dictate their lives, telling them what to do and what not to do. Some, on the other hand, just plainly from ignorance. They plainly just say they don't understand God's word. It's too difficult. So uh, they're just living their lives as best as they can. We even find some going to church regularly. But the problem is that uh, the, the pastors have stopped talking about what God wants us to do and what he doesn't want us to do, or what want us to do. So they have left the law of God, the scriptures, and now they are telling people what they want to do and how they can do it. And those things the New Testament calls old wives' tales. People just come on pulpits and they have stories upon stories about eagles and mountains and all sorts of things, forgetting the law of God. And let me say this, um, till now, all some people know about God is more or less the same knowledge they had as unbelievers. That knowledge where their father and mother taught them, read your Bible, 
pray every day and uh, you know all the things you need to know as a Christian be good be nice some people that is still the knowledge they have so far and, and they claim to be very religious but, but let me say this and remember I'm still my introduction you cannot learn anything as a dead person spiritually there is nothing about God that you can know when you are dead. The reason I say that is that you might hear the information, but it will not, you will not really know the meaning till you are spiritually awake. So I just want to encourage us quickly in this introduction, don't smuggle in any knowledge that you had about God when you were not a Christian. Don't smuggle it into your Christian walk. Be one that is open to learning about the law of God. That passage that you know very well, now that you know that you've been a Christian, check it again and understand what is there. When you come into a new family or a new country or a new kingdom, uh, there must be of necessity some form of orientation. And this is talking about the laws, the do's and the don'ts of that country. And as the scripture puts it in Romans 12, it says, and do not be conformed to this world. That is where we are coming from, when we were dead, isn't it? It says in that in verse 2, but be conformed, be, but, sorry, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. So if you are not transformed by the renewing of your mind, if you notice, you cannot prove what the will of God is. So I want to mention a few things that can help us change our mindsets and which can help us renew our minds. It's just so that we indeed can have indeed biblical worldviews even as we tackle this very, very popular scripture in Isaiah 4, 6. So my topic this evening is the command of knowing God. The command of knowing God and as I said before my text is from Uzziah 4.6 our, our reading our Bible reading uh, starts in the midst of God declaring judgments upon his people uh, because they had turned away from him the people of God had totally left anything that had to do with the law of God they had gone their own way and so we read in Uzziah 4, 6, it says, My people, my people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I, I, I will not be able to expound on every line and every word, but I, I, I'm putting some tension on some of the words so that you can think about it. My people, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. So, Uzziah, let me just give you some background, historical background. Uzziah is the first book of what the, the Jews call, call the Twelve. Uzziah, whose name means salvation, was called to exemplify the relationship between God and Israel through his marriage to a harlot. Uh, this was a time um, when the Israelites left God and went oaring with the world and other gods. And just as we read, we read in our Bible reading, many had forgotten God and were serving other gods. They were serving idols. And this book is particularly interesting if you uh, ever take the time to study it because it shows how men so very quickly stray away from the Lord and commit all sorts of sin against him. It also shows us how God was not quiet. He wasn't quiet in their disobedience because he sent them his prophet. So, let us take it line by line so that it's clear what that verse means. My people are destroyed or cut off for lack of knowledge. If you think about it, the reason... Uh, they are being cut off is not because God's mercies 
um, have somehow ceased or God has stopped loving them. It's not because God doesn't want fellowship with them. No. They are destroyed and cut off because of their lack of knowledge. And when you look at lack of knowledge here, yeah, it speaks of lack of discernment or lack of wisdom, lack of understanding how to please God or lack of knowing the things that you ought to do and the things you ought not to do. Lack of knowledge as how, as how God wants to be worshipped. So you see, they prefer to know about every other thing. They prefer to know about fashion. They prefer to know about every other thing but have the knowledge of God. So, the, so, they, lack, so they lack that knowledge out of rebellion towards God. But, I mean, as you can see this, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So because they don't have that wisdom of God, because they don't have the law of God, they are destroyed. And as you think about it, God will not change for any man. I mean, at this point, you would think, maybe as it is God's people, my people, maybe he will bend a bit. Maybe just bend a bit. But he says, as long as they don't have the knowledge of God, these people are cut off. So I wrote here, I said, God will not change because of man. You thinking that God will change his law, is you saying that God can change. God is one with his law, and the law of God displays his character and reveals to us who he is. So God is not going to change his law. Sin will always be sin. In, in Psalm 33, verse 11, the Bible says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. So it's an everlasting law. It's a divine law. And so man without the law will be cut off. Man without the law will be destroyed. It is the rejecting of the law that brings destruction. That's another way to put it. The rejecting of the law that brings that destruction. You remember John 3, 19. This is the, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. You, you see the point? There is light, but men will say no to knowledge and will prefer ignorance of God, thinking that they can hide under that, that guise. So my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So I, I hope you see why and how people will be destroyed. Some people say that you, know, you, you can have a good heart, for instance, and never know about Christ, and somehow you'll make it to heaven. Some people say, out of all the millions of people that don't know about Jesus and they are good people, are you telling me that they will go to hell? Some even argue that you don't need to know so much about Jesus. The minute you just at least know, you know that Jesus died for your sins, then that is all well and good. But if you read this and you think about it, those that rejected knowledge, those that played the ignorant card, are people that will be destroyed or rejected by God. So the next line is interesting. It says, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from uh, being my priest. So it's saying the same thing, but he looks at it now from a different angle. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. And the, the, this reject here is what we've been trying to talk about. It is, it is to treat something with disgust. Or something, you hear something and it's repulsive to you. Or you hear something and it's disturbing your flu. You hear something about the law of God or the command of God 
and it doesn't sit well with you because it's maybe too difficult or it's sounding too legalistic. So the rejection, yeah, as we see, is to abhor the law of God. The rejection of God's knowledge, as our passage, passage indicates, results in God rejecting us. And just so that you can see some examples, we see an example we saw. King Saul being the first king of Israel, isn't it? going on his own way looking for his father's donkeys, isn't it? Yeah? And he was anointed by Samuel. But King Saul later on refused to obey God or accept God's authority. He became law to himself. Thinking himself wiser than God at every command God gave him, um, he began to, in a sense, neglect or forgets God's law. The things that God told him to do and the things that God told him not to do, he began in a sense to forget about it. And we will see later on that this not knowing knowledge doesn't mean that you don't know that the knowledge It is you not doing it. And so you will find uh, Saul at one time offering sacrifices himself because he couldn't wait for Samuel, isn't it? Uh, he was sent to destroy a people but no, he brought the king back and spoils, and, it's, and that's where we get that phrase where Samuel said, obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. So let me just read a portion to you in 1 Samuel 13. So Samuel said to Saul, just to show you what he did, you have acted foolishly. This is when he offered up that sacrifice. You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, for now the Lord will have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you, and so the Lord rejected Saul. Do we see that clear picture? It wasn't like Saul did not know what to do, the minute he did not do what God told him to do, it was the same as rejecting the knowledge of God. So, are you listening to me? If you are listening to me, whether you are watching, have you heard the gospel at one time and you say, it's not for me now? Maybe someone told you about that vicarious work, that substitutional work of Christ, and you say, that doesn't concern me. My belly now is aching, and so uh, the, the gospel isn't so important. Or maybe you've heard the gospel preached so many times that you now despise it. It's not a big deal anymore. I don't know if you, if you go out to evangelize, do you see that? You talk, one talks about, about the gospel, they're like, ah, uh, there are things we know. You despise the ordinances of God. My brother and sister, the fear of God as we know is what? The beginning of knowledge. So let me tell you, or better say, let me show you God's response to those that despise his word. Those who reject his gift in the person of Christ. Those who will not repent from their sins and turn to Christ as he has commanded in Leviticus. So the picture I'm trying to paint to you is that this Bible must be embraced from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. It all has to be embraced. There's no part of it that you can not like and not be too comfortable with and then there's a part that you're comfortable with. In Leviticus 26, let me read this to you, verse 14. Leviticus 26, 14. It says, But if you do not obey me, and you do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my status, and if your soul abhors my ordinances, so as not to carry out my commandments, and so break my covenant, 16 says, I, in turn, 
will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, cons consumption and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you. And you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Is that scary enough? This is the kind of fear that Pastor Tony says it's good. Lest we think that we serve a God that does not punish sin or rebellion. When God gives a command in his word, we are to obey that command. We are not to edit it. We are not to modify it. We are to do what the law says as prescribed. I mean, if you think about Saul's story, I mean, the point was offering on sacrifice, Sabi, and Saul was not there, and then he just did it. It's not like he did something else, isn't it? The, the point was destroying the people and shaming them, isn't it? And so he, he, he killed everybody, left only the king, and brought good things. That small modifying or, or, or editing is tantamount to this. But as we read all this and we have that godly fear that we should have, let me remind you that it's not God's desire that anyone should perish. But that all may come to repentance. And that is why he sent Hosea to the Israelites. And that is why you are hearing this today. That you may repent of your sins and turn away from the world. You read it so many times. The world killed our Savior. Repent from the world and turn away from sin. But you have some sins that you are still keeping somewhere. The Bible says repent. Repent. That, that is the law of God. That is the command of God to you if sin is still the order of the day for you. If you are still basking in worldliness and hatred for your brother and you don't care about the things of God, this is... God giving you another chance. Repent. Turn to me. Confess your sins and leave all those wicked ways the Lord is saying. Because God will reject those who reject his knowledge. And as you, if you look closely at the line we are in, it says... Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. So, God rejecting his people for being his priests can mean two things. And the first is what I think he's majorly talking about. That the Lord will reject their worship because they have rejected his knowledge. Does that make any sense? It's still the same story I'll, I'll push to you. Saul. Saul made a sacrifice. You know what was a sacrifice? But God rejected it because he didn't do it in accordance to the knowledge of God or to the things that he's supposed to do and the things he's not supposed to do. And I, I remind you again the reason why God has not unleashed his full wrath upon those who have not believed yet. It's not because the Lord is slow. It's, don't count his patience, as I wrote here, as slowness. To act or in awe. Don't count his, 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 his long suffering as inability to act. It's because he wants you to repent now. Repent. Is there something in the law of God that you are still fighting with? Is there maybe a doctrine of grace that you, for some reason, don't agree? It has been shown to you in scriptures, but you just feel it's not gelling with you. The Bible is telling us here to submit to the knowledge of God, to the law of God. So the lack, let me just repeat it, so the lack of so the lack or rejection of the knowledge of God brings about the lack of acceptance of worship or rejection of your worship 
which we know is not worship. So what are we saying? You cannot serve God in ignorance. If you think that Christianity is you clocking two hours every Sunday in church, that is not Christianity. No, no. You cannot serve God in ignorance. I, I mean that in two ways. You won't know what to do, and that ignorance itself is already a form of rebellion. Or better still, you cannot serve God by doing what you please. You cannot claim ignorance because he has revealed his word to you. But as I said, that's the first part that we can apply to ourselves such that our prayers uh, become nothing. In ignorance, if you pray not according to God's word, God will not hear you, for instance. Do you, do you understand that? If, if out of just pure ignorance you do that, or whether out of rebellion, refusing what the Bible has said, how we ought to pray, God will not accept your prayer. That is the first part. There's the second part, uh, which also speaks of those who lead in one capacity or the other. Because if you read it, it says that because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. So as though he's speaking to those who are priests in one sense or the other. So I wrote here, um, so be, but it, is, it also speaks to those who lead in one capacity or the other in the church, especially pastors or, or elders. Because as Malachi 2, 7 says, for the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. The lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. And men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But because they have rejected knowledge, as we see many do in our country, and all over the world today, they are busy, because they have rejected that knowledge, they are busy teaching, teaching people things that do not accord with sound teaching of the scriptures. They, they bring in psychology and uh, bring in business strategies and motivational speaking uh, and, and, and teaching principles that tickles people's fancy. By doing this, they despise the knowledge of God and turn people aside from the way, thereby causing many to stumble and corrupt the gospel. And hey, we must ask ourselves also as BCM teachers, as, as those in the campus and secondary schools, are we teaching the knowledge of God? Or are we taking likely that we can go there and just freestyle with the children? Is there some thoughts to what you're doing, ensuring that you are not in any way saying what the Bible is not saying? Jesus made it clear, very clear in Luke 17, 12. It will, rather, it will be better for him if a mouse stone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. I hope so far I'm clear. So far I'm clear. Let's look at the last line in this verse that we are going through. So uh, we've looked at my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. The last line then says, since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Forgotten. To be oblivious of something. It indicates the knowledge has been lost to memory. The knowledge was there before, but time has softened the memory of that truth or that law of God. So are you well acquainted with the word of God or is it all become blood because you are now too busy chasing money? Uh, could you, could, are you someone that says in those days when we used to memorize scripture? Or because of some situation in your life, it's too so difficult for you to have time for God's word. So you are, you are busy about your life. Because God's word can take a back seat. 
Or no, you you know enough of the uh, means uh, of this of the doctrines of grace to last you a lifetime. So you know why study? Why bother going through the notes every? So, why I, I know I know these things. You will forget. You will forget. The minute you have that mindset that you've known enough and that the knowledge you have about God is fine, you will forget. And we see here, since you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. If you read Matthew 13, it explains this, how people forget in Matthew 13. So it says, for whoever has, to him more shall be given. So it means that, okay, let me finish reading and explain it. Whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. This is, you, you have the law of God and you are not taking more. The little you have will be taken away from you. That's what he's saying here. And when it's, it is lost to memory or it has become something that is, that its weight has been lost, then God will also forget your children. Let me just ask us this before I round off. Are we constantly seeking to know more about God or the information we have so far is sufficient? Because the only way, reason, looking at this text, that a man can be cut off is if, is if he rejects that knowledge of God. I don't know about you, are very forgetful people. Very forgetful, isn't it? If you look at the, the Israelites and, and the way they went through the wilderness, they, it was as if they never remembered yesterday. There was constant grumble in the midst of any trouble. We forget. And see, the way not to forget is to keep heeding or keep knowing this knowledge of God. So when he says, yeah, I will forget your children, it means no generation after you will know him. Why? Because uh, really you have nothing to pass on to that generation. It's all faded. So your lineage become cut off from the promise of God. What causes this forgetting? Please turn with me to this same Uzziah. What will cause this forgetting? Why will somebody forget? I hope, I hope we are following. What, what will cause this forgetting? Look, look at what it says in Uzziah 13, verse 6. It says, As they had their pasture, they became satisfied, and being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. They forgot me. So you, you, we see the things that can cause you to forget God, isn't it? One trouble, or, you know, from the context here, you know, you are satisfied. You know, everything is fine. And your heart now becomes proud that I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. And I can relate that to you knowing about Tulip and saying you are okay. You are not okay. So uh, my, my desire is to spur you up to want to know the law of God more. And I wanted to bring it to you in such a way for you to know it's not, it's not an option. It's not a, um, a suggestion. It is God's command that we all love his law and be knowledgeable. So my brothers and sisters, we have a personal responsibility to seek after God. We have a personal responsibility to be available for all the means God has provided for us not to forget his commands. I'm sure most of us know by now that there's nothing in Christianity like in those days. 
in those days. First Chronicles, First Chronicles, sorry, verse chapter twenty-eight, verse nine. First Chronicles twenty-eight, nine. As I close. First Chronicles. 28 verse 9 says as for you my son Solomon know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart I mean it, it, it's not what I'm teaching but can you see the, the sequence Solomon wasn't told to serve the Lord then know God the Bible says, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thought. If you seek him, if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you. Oh, the, the passage isn't finished. It will reject you forever. <laughs> forever. 10 says, Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary, to be courageous and act. If you just dissect this, you see that even ministry and working for the Lord starts from knowing God, worshiping God aright, and then taking that which you've experienced with God, and you know about God, and then telling it to the world. It's not the other way around. You, you cannot be effective in ministry if you do not know. It, it's not about teaching the children. It's not just about, okay, I need to read this so that I can teach the children. No. It's about loving God so much that you want to know all of him. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Uh, Romans uh, 10, 17 help, helps us to, to make that clear in our mind. It says, it tells us how this faith comes. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing the word about Christ. So if he says, my people are dist um, sorry. So if he says, and without faith it is impossible to please him, what faith is he talking about? The knowledge of Christ. So I, I want us to be hungry for the scriptures. Don't be satisfied with the Sunday, Sunday tonic, as Pastor Femi used to put it. Let us be people that are searching out the Lord. Pastor Tony preaches, you don't understand, you go straight to him. You are searching out the things of God. I'll say this, and I'll say it clearly. The only reason why God will reject you is if you reject his son. Is if you reject his son. The only reason why you will perish is if you don't have the knowledge of Christ. That is the only reason. So we must utilize all the avenues that God has graciously given us to know him. Whether it's Bible reading, whether it's listening to sermons, whether it's fellowship with believers, whether it's prayer, all these things. Because the aim is that we may know Christ. We must long after Christ like is our breath and he is, isn't he the giver of life we must hunger after Christ like he is our food for he is the bread of life we must thirst for him for he is the water of life if we drink we will never thirst again knowing him is all that matters dear brothers and sisters and this should be our greatest delight. I want to say to you, for a man to come to Christ, he needs to know Christ. For a man to stay in Christ, he needs to know Christ. We must truly desire to grow in the knowledge of God. And as we read this again, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my prince. Since you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. Let it be a, a means of just reminding us or, or waking us up if we are asleep. 
to say, no, this is not what God has called. God has not called me to ignorance. He has called me to knowledge. And let us stand up and truly know our God. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Uh, let's sing first, sorry, and then we pray. <laughs> sorry. In one, in three, five, seven, come.